people like Christmas. I think I think all of us in here would be in agreement with that statement. People like Christmas. By and large, the people that I've known during my lifetime, pretty much every single one of them has liked Christmas. Maybe not 100% of them, but the vast majority of them. They like the parties. They like the time off from work. They like the gifts. They like the warm feelings it gives. They like the family gatherings. They like the colorful decorations. And yeah, yeah, a good number of them, they like the Christmas story too. It's a familiar story, what I just read for you. That's a story that the majority of us in this room have heard numerous times and read numerous times over the years. In fact, some of us have heard it so much that our minds have a tendency of kind of going into neutral when we're in a setting like this because uh, we've heard it so often that it's easy for our mind to drift. And what I have found is that sometimes it helps to take a magnifying glass and to study one facet closely instead of trying to reabsorb the whole story at one time. And that kind of helps in dealing with a very familiar story. So let's do that this afternoon. After the angel, as I read that, after the angel tells the shepherds that a Savior has been born, the angel then tells them how to find the baby. And the key verse there was verse 12. It says, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The angel had just declared some incredible news to them by saying that I bring you good news of great joy. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. The city of David, they all knew what the city of David was. That was Bethlehem. But where? Where in Bethlehem? Granted, Bethlehem wasn't a huge city, but at the same time, it's pretty safe to say Jesus wasn't the only baby there, too. So how would the shepherds know? How would they find the baby? Well, that's where verse 12 comes into play. The angels are specifically telling them this is what to look for. I know the text, and actually most translations do read this way. It says, there will be a sign for you. But in actuality, the original language that the New Testament was written in, it's the definite article instead of, the word a, it's the word the that is found in the text. This will be the sign for you. It's something very specific that the angel is drawing reference to. Now, you would expect that if the angel said, this will be the sign, this will be the sign for you, you would expect there to be something fairly incredible that would serve as that sign. You would expect a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse. You would expect for the, the moon to turn colors. You would expect for, for something sensational to be the sign. But as you read the text, that's not the way it works. Instead, it says that this will be the sign for you you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. That doesn't sound very sensational. I mean, when you stop and think about it, that doesn't, that, that, there's, there's really not much of anything that's spectacular about that. I mean, it seems fairly ordinary, a little odd, you know, saying that the baby's lying in a manger. There's something a little unusual about that, but still it seems to be fairly ordinary in a lot of ways. Think of it this way. If somebody came to the United States who had never been to the United States before and they had only read about some things pertaining to our country, and this was their very first time being here, and they had it on their uh, uh, list of things to do is they wanted 
to try as hard as they could to meet the chief executive, obviously that being our president. They wanted to meet our president. And so they were asking for your help. What would you tell them? Okay, someone who had never stepped foot in the United States, and now they're here, and they're saying, what do I need to do? Where do I need to go? How can I meet the president? You probably would give some instructions somewhat along the lines of saying, well, you need to go to this place called Washington, D.C. You need to look for a really big White House, and if you see a man that is walking out of the house and he's surrounded by a bunch of police officers and security people wearing these earbuds and all, and they're heading toward a helicopter, then you probably see the president then. And on top of that, if, if you're seeing that he's surrounded by all these cameras and there's reporters that are barking out questions and comments and stuff like that, then you can pretty much bet you now have seen the president. But when you look in verse 12, right after it says that the Messiah has been born, good news of great joy, the Messiah has been born in Bethlehem. What sign was given to signify that Jesus the Savior was here? Well, it says it right there. A baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Most people missed it. Jesus, Jesus' entrance into this world, most people missed it. We know that the Jewish people for, for centuries of time were looking for the promised Messiah. So we know that there were people that were watching for his arrival. We know that Herod's scribes, they knew that the scripture said back in what we refer to as the Old Testament, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that this one who was coming would come and be born. He, he would come to Bethlehem. They, they knew that. And so it wasn't like people were totally in the dark. So why didn't they recognize him when he came? Well, I think the answer is rather obvious when you look at the sign that the angel referenced. They weren't expecting a baby in a manger. Nobody was looking for that. That was too simple. That was too unexceptional. Because everyone was looking for something a lot bigger, more impactful. Not a baby in a manger. But there he was. He was a baby. Granted, the fact that he was in a feeding trough, again, I say that was a bit unusual, but he was a baby all the same. But that's part of what makes the Christmas story so incredible. That Jesus, being who he was, he temporarily set aside his glory in heaven, and he took on human flesh, and he entered into our world, vulnerable of all things, as an infant, as one of us. Doctrinally, this is called the incarnation. That's the word that's used. Where God, in the person of Jesus, humbled himself, and he took on human flesh. There was nothing about the baby Jesus that appeared supernatural on that occasion when he was in the manger. There was no halo over his head. I know you've seen paintings, and I've seen those same paintings. There was no halo over his head. He was just a baby in a manger. If you had been here and if you had no other information to go on, you would have concluded that this was just a baby born to a poor young couple down on their luck. That's what your conclusion would have been. Mangers, those things were a dime a dozen. There's nothing unusual about mangers. They were all over the place, and they were kind of dirty and smelly too. But as you well know, 
what made this so special is that this was more than just a baby. It was a baby, but it was a very special baby. Luke's gospel tells it in the way that I just read it. And of course, only those in the front row apparently heard me. But, um, you know, Luke's gospel tells it from a human perspective, the way the story played out. But this is one of the values of reading multiple gospels. There's four gospels in the New Testament. And when you read from all four perspectives, you gain insights. John, in his gospel, he gives some, uh, uh, some special insight in regards to, to this, this one that took on human flesh and dwelt among us. In fact, he doesn't even say that until verse 14 of John chapter 1. And before he builds up to that and saying that he took, fle- he took on flesh and he dwelt among us. Before that, John says this about this one who is coming. In verse 3, it says, All things were created through him, and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. You talk about building up, building things up. That's what John was doing. He was getting ready to tell the story of Jesus, and he's saying, Oh, this one, this one that was coming. All things were created through him. And apart from him, there wasn't a single thing that was created. And then just a few verses later, in verse 10, he says, He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. And that's why I say, most people missed it. Jesus coming into this world, Jesus being who he was, most people missed it. Though he had created all things, he was the creator and the sustainer of all things. In fact, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, All of the fullness of deity dwelt in him in bodily form. That means all the fullness of Godhood was in Jesus. This wasn't a mini-God. This was God in the flesh. Yet people missed it. Think about it by... By conservative estimates, now that we have the Hubble telescope and seeing further into space than we've ever seen before, by conservative estimates, there are 10 billion trillion stars known in the universe. And you can Google that, and you'll find that's a conservative number. 10 billion trillion. Some say there's seven times that many. But 10 billion trillion basically is a number that we can't even grasp. It's like taking the number 10 and then adding 21 zeros to it. There's that many stars in the known universe. And this one, named Jesus, is the one who created every single one of them. According to passages of scripture like this. When Caesar Augustus thought he ruled the world, the one who spoke all galaxies and their stars into existence was laying there in a feeding trough. I mean, think about that. When Quirinius was governor of Syria, the star maker himself entrusted himself to a teenage girl named Mary. When Herod the Great was strutting his power across the scene, the one who created and sustained all things needed a mother to feed him and to change his diapers. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. When you stop and you just consider this, the angel said to the shepherds, This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. No ordinary baby. Jesus didn't become an angel for the sake of the angels. Jesus didn't become an eagle for the sake of the eagles. Jesus didn't become an endangered well for the sake of marine life. 
He became a human being like me and like you. He loves us so much that he became like us. A lot of people believe that God can sympathize with our struggles. God can sympathize with our pain. But those same people wonder if God can empathize with our pain. And the answer to that is a resounding yes. He took on human flesh and he became a man. He became a human being. Initially in the text that I read, he was an infant, but he didn't remain an infant. It's no wonder the Bible records in passages like Isaiah chapter 7, and it records the same thing in Matthew chapter 1, these words, the virgin shall bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us. That's what Jesus was named. God with us. This isn't the end of the story. This is the end of what we're talking about here today, perhaps, but it's not the end of the story in so many ways. This is just the beginning of the story because Jesus didn't remain a baby. He grew. He became a man. He taught. He revealed things to people so that they could better know God. And ultimately, Jesus came and did the very thing that was his purpose all along for coming into the world, and that is he went to the cross. That was all intentional on his part. It wasn't a matter of him being in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was exactly where he knew he needed to be because the reason he came into the world wasn't because of curiosity. He wanted to be able to see the sights. That's not why he came. He came into the world because you needed him to come into the world. I needed him to come and ultimately to do what he did when he went to the cross and he died on our behalf. We do this every every Christmas Eve service. We have a time of communion. And I want to invite you to feel free if you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus. I want to invite you to share in this time. If you feel uncomfortable with that, that's fine. Just pass the trays on by. Our ushers will be preparing for that now, but just feel free to pass the trays on. But but for all that are in here that are, are followers of Jesus, this is a time when we reflect and we remember the fact that Christmas happened. There was a reason behind it all. Jesus came in order to rescue you and to rescue me, and to secure a future that would stretch into all of eternity for us. And that's what the cross was all about. So we celebrate his birth on this weekend, but we also celebrate the mission that he was on. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today and the opportunity that we have to be able to be together to to get together and spend time with our family, our loved ones, but also time to get together with brothers and sisters in Christ, to be together with our family of God, and to celebrate this special celebration. Jesus loved us so much that he deliberately, willingly, came into this world knowing it was going to be at great cost personally to be able to achieve for us what we could not do for ourselves. Father, as we take the bread, we eat it in the cup, and we drink it, we're reminded of the body and the blood of Christ and the sacrifice that was made, the sacrifice that set us free from a hopeless future sacrifice that made it possible for us to be able to live life knowing full well this isn't the final chapter there's something far greater on the horizon thank you Lord for loving us so much 
that you would send Jesus, your son, on our behalf. It's in his name we pray. Amen.